So today we're going to be talking about the superior orbital fissure and differentiating it from cavernous sinus lesions and orbital apex lesions. And they're very similar because they're very close together. And so you need to know a little bit about the anatomy of these structures before we can make any kind of decision on localization. So as you know, the cavernous sinus, in this example in coronal section, has a dural wall and the internal carotid artery is inside the cavernous sinus. In the wall are cranial nerves three, four, and five, subdivision one in the anterior portion of the cavernous sinus. In the posterior portion of the cavernous sinus, we have V2. The V3 does not go into the cavernous sinus and exits out the foraminal valve. The sixth nerve is in the substance of the cavernous sinus, not in the wall. And that means cavernous sinus lesions can present with just the sixth nerve to pulse it. And that's why that's particularly dangerous. So any lesion in the cavernous sinus can produce any combination of cranial nerves three, four, five, one, and two, and six. In addition, the sympathetics travel for a short course on the sixth nerve before traveling on the five subdivision one to pass through the superior orbital fissure. And so we might have a concomitant Horner syndrome in patients who have a cavernous sinus syndrome. The superior orbital fissure connects the cavernous sinus with the orbital apex. And so once you have the orbital apex, you're gonna add in the cranial neuropathy of optic nerve. That's a two. Two does not live in the cavernous sinus. So if we have an RAPD, a relative afferent pupillary defect, loss of acuity, loss of field, or a swollen or pale nerve, that's a two. And if we have a combination of three, four, five, one, two, or six plus two, that's gonna place us into the cavernous sinus. The superior oral fissure is gonna be very difficult to differentiate from cavernous sinus because it's the same cranial nerves. You should know, however, that the pattern of involvement of the superior orbital fissure involves the branches of the trigeminal as well as the individual divisions of the third cranial nerve. So that's going to be the lacrimal nerve, the frontal, the trochlear, the superior division of cranial nerve three, the nasociliary nerve, the inferior branch of cranial nerve three, and the abducens nucleus. So in the superior orbital fissure, we have branches of the trigeminal, the branches of cranial nerves three, four, and six, and uh, that's gonna represent the general orientation of the nerves inside the superior orbital fissure. So when you're dealing with patients who have a multiple cranial neuropathy, you should be thinking about cavernous sinus if all the cranial nerves are on the same side, with or without the Horner syndrome. If you have the multiple cranial neuropathy, proptosis, orbital signs, and an optic neuropathy, that's gonna put us in the orbital apex. The superior orbital fissure and the cavernous sinus are gonna be quite similar, but because of the divisional nature, you can get divisional palsies in the superior orbital fissure. That's much harder to do in the cavernous sinus, but in general, superior orbital fissure and cavernous sinus have very similar presentations. So you know, need to know a little bit about the anatomy because it only tells you where the lesion is. It doesn't tell you what it is, whether it's cavernous sinus meningioma or intracavernous aneurysm or thrombosis or tumor, you cannot tell. You just need to know where the lesion is first and then you can figure out why the lesion is and you're gonna direct the imaging towards the locations that we see.